Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are a lover of true, creepy, or scary stories, I do believe this channel will be for you. If at any time you enjoy what you are hearing, please check down below. We would love to have you as part of the Back to Ashes family. Also, please feel free to subscribe, like, share, and comment. With that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Board Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video will be facts and stories mixed together. I hope you don't mind. Let's get to the vocal melatonin, shall we? Ouija boards were developed and commercialized during the spiritualist movement of the late 1880s to make money off of gullible people. They became popular as a parlor game. Scientific studies have been conducted, recreating the effects of the Ouija board in the lab and showing that, under laboratory conditions, the subjects were moving the planchette involuntarily. There are some serious scientists who have investigated near-death experiences, mediumship, and reincarnation. They would love to prove that there is more than materialism. If some scientists could prove that a spirit world is a reality, then that would be the greatest scientific discovery of the century. They would be famous and win the Nobel Peace Prize. Ouija boards would then be found in laboratories all over the world. If the Ouija board actually worked, then historians would be able to gather information directly from spirits who lived in historical periods. Police would use Ouija boards to solve murders. Information from Ouija boards could be entered into court laws. The military and CIA would use Ouija boards to gather information on foreign governments. Unfortunately, Ouija boards don't work that way and are only useful as a parlor game or so some think. Zozo, the Ouija board's most famous demon. An internet hoax or a haunting through the ages? Ouija boards occupy a significant spot in supernatural folklore. Dabblers in the occult have probably tried to communicate with the dead using one of these famous spirit boards. Curious horror lovers have likely heard at least one allegedly true story from someone whose attempt to use a Ouija board that went terribly wrong. Even people with no interest in the paranormal may have spotted a Ouija board for sale in a toy store. Differing impressions aside, the fact remains the Ouija boards have a spooky mystique. Whether or not they truly allow users to communicate with the other side, the possibility has caused no small amount of excitement and fear. Wouldn't it be cool if you could talk to the dead? Some people think so. On the flip side, using a Ouija board is not without risk. No one would ever accuse any occult ritual of being safe. And spirit boards are no different. Numerous cautionary tales abound. Depending on where you use the board, you might invite something into your space, and that something may never want to leave. You might have set out to communicate with your recently departed aunt, but something else may masquerade as your dead relative instead. And perhaps the most possibility of all, if you don't close your session with the Ouija board properly, typically by moving the planchette across to the word goodbye, you might open a portal to the spirit world. Fans of the supernatural have probably heard stories about all of the above. 
Ouija board users aren't shy about sharing their unexplained experiences. And in today's digital age, these stories can now be shared online, where they can spread across the internet to inspire people everywhere. The Rise of Zozo In March 2009, Darren Evans shared his true own personal experiences with a Ouija board on the online site, True Ghost Tales. His story revolves around encounters with a specific entity named Zozo. These interactions follow a pattern recognizable to people familiar with Ouija board sessions gone awry. The entity first manifested as a friendly spirit but subsequent communications reveal its true, hostile nature. According to Evans, Zozo proceeded to threaten him and his loved ones. For example, Evans claims his then-girlfriend underwent a stark personality change after the entity declared its intention to possess her. The problems didn't end there. Allegedly, his young daughter nearly drowned in a bathtub and would later be hospitalized for a mysterious infection. While these incidents can be easily explained away as coincidences, Evans sincerely believed he and his family were under a demonic attack by Zozo. Less easily explained away were the strange occurrences around his home. House guests said they heard voices coming from inside the walls. Lights would turn on and off by themselves. Doors would unlock and open without any help. All these incidents were classic hallmarks of a haunting, possibly by an entity who used a spirit board as a conduit into our world and now refuses to leave. Given these unusual experiences, you'd think Evans would stop using the Ouija board. Even the most hardened skeptic would probably decide to leave things alone at this point. And by all accounts, Evans was the opposite of a skeptic. But by his own admission, he kept using the spirit board despite warning other people away from any encounter with an entity that calls itself Zozo. Have other people encountered Zozo. Despite Evan's tale not being especially unique, from another unlucky Ouija board encounters, Zozo would go on to take over the paranormal world. Evan's encounter went viral, and more alleged Zozo stories sprouted up across all over the internet, many of which ended up being retold on various podcasts and covered by many YouTube channels. The stories typically followed a similar pattern to the traditional Ouija board encounter. A person holds a session with a Ouija board. They communicate with an entity that might start out friendly, but always ends up hostile. Sometimes strange encounters take place during the session or begin shortly after. But in every one of these encounters, the entity identifies itself as Zozo. While the number of alleged Zozo encounters exploded after the original posting on True Ghost Tales, Evans himself claims to have read other stories recounting similar interactions before sharing his experiences online. So, what's going on here? Is Zozo a real entity that has contacted unsuspected dabblers of spirit boards throughout history? Is Zozo an internet urban legend that inspired similar stories the same way that Slenderman created an entire mythos at the height of his popularity? Or, as Evans claimed, is Zozo something much older? Something that predates the internet itself? Zozo throughout the ages. Whether or not you believe Evans's account or the many others like it, the fact remains that the name Zozo does appear throughout history. One of the earliest mentions can be found in Le Dictionnaire Inferno, first published in 1816. Within its passages, 
Author Jacques Auguste Simon Colin Duplancy tells the story of a girl possessed by three demons, one of which was named Zozo. But less acknowledged is that within the same text, Duplancy would go to assert that the girl's story was untrue. The declaration isn't without merit because the girl was previously punished for false claims of demonic possession. Other people think the name Zozo comes from Pazuzu, a Mesopotamian deity said to be the king of demons associated with the wind. According to ancient religious beliefs, he caused famine and brought locusts down upon the people. If the name Pazuzu sounds familiar, there's a good reason. Horror aficionados will recognize him as the demon that possesses Reagan in the movie The Exorcist. If these details do little to convince you of Zozo's actual existence, you are not alone. It does sound suspiciously like someone cobbled together various tidbits of supernatural lore to gain internet stardom. Zozo in modern pop culture. True or not, the Zozo story followed in the footsteps of many viral sensations before it and inspired a feature-length film, I Am Zozo, a psychological thriller which was released in 2012 to mixed reviews. The movie revolves around five teenagers who play with a Ouija board on Halloween and inadvertently summon a demon. The film drew inspiration from the numerous Zozo stories in circulation at the time. For his part, Darren Evans would later appear in Ghost Adventures. He would also publish a book about his experiences in 2016. In both instances, he added more details to his alleged Zozo encounters, which only cast more doubt on the veracity of his claims. Memory is fallible, and it's true that some details of incidents may come to us later but skeptics point to this further embellishment as the actions of someone wishing to remain relevant. Is Zozo real or not? We may never know if Darren Evans made up his original Zozo encounter. We do know that despite his claims of other Zozo stories having been shared online at the time of this first posting, they have never, ever been found. Nevertheless, the entity caught the attention of the internet and other dabblers in the occult. Even if Zozo himself may not be real, we cannot deny that there are many stories of Ouija board sessions gone awry. Perhaps the truth is something simpler. He gives a unified name to a common experience shared by spirit board users who accidentally contact a hostile spirit. This is my experience with the Ouija board. It was my third year in college. I was staying in the hostel. Me and some of my friends used to try all kinds of stuff. So it wouldn't be surprising that this Ouija board thing got our attention. Okay, enough with the intro. Now the story. It was the night before our semester exam. Since we finished our studies already, we decided to try the Ouija board. We thought to give it a shot at midnight, but first, we need the Ouija board. Making a Ouija board was not so tough, as we got tons of information from the internet. Me and my friend made it step by step, as they've instructed in how to do anything. After an hour, we created an exact replica of a typical Ouija board. I must tell you, it wasn't that scary after all clock ticked. Time was 12. We told everyone in our floor about this experiment and invited them. Most of them were taken aback and chose not to involve. At least we were about six in the room and decided to start the procedure. We switched off all the light and put cell phones in silent mode. And then I started talking. I gave a warning to all about the things that could go wrong 
And so, if anyone wanted to leave, they would have to do it now. Because once we start calling the dead, nobody would not be allowed outside or inside. Everybody was okay with that. Then, I set the mood for it by lighting a candle and placed the Ouija board beside it. As we decided already, two of my friends came forward and sat opposite of each other. Everyone was so calm, and the situation was getting intense. The two guys sat very close, and the Ouija board was placed above their lap. As instructed in the rules, their knees touched each other. So, they both started focusing on the candlelight and placed their hands above one another on the board. Then I said, Dear Spirit, we want to talk to one of you. We really wish you'd come talk to us. After a while, I spoke again. Is there any spirits in the room? Nobody answered. Nothing. Their hands stood still. I asked again. No answer. Then, after some more silence, I ask again. No fucking answer. Everyone was losing their patience, and so was I. I decided to give it another try. Is there any spirits in the room? Again, no movement of hands. Oh, wait. They were moving. They were actually moving. We really could not believe our eyes and the hands moved to the side of, yes. I spoke again. Now that you're here, we really wish to know your name, please. It started again. The hands, they were moving. As we had expected this already, one of my friends took his notebook and started taking note of the letters it mentioned. It was a bunch of random letters. We couldn't make any sense of it, but we couldn't leave it like that. You must know, if you call the spirit, you should send them back too. And remember, all these times those two guys who had the Ouija board on them had their eyes closed. I ask another question. So, how did you die? Once more, the hands were moving through a bunch of letters and finally settled on a word. Siva died. We were like, what the hell does this mean? Anyway, we proceeded further. I asked, when did you die? This time the hands were moving over the numbers on the board. The answer said, 11.05.1963. That was a pretty old one. I asked again, what's your wish? That was a foolish move. Why did I do that? Anyway, the hands were moving faster and we got an answer which said, Dirge. We didn't know whether there was any word like this or not. By this time, all of us were extremely scared. So, everyone showed me some actions to stop this shit. And thus I said, Okay, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming. Goodbye. After a minute, the guys opened their eyes and they seemed normal. They both said it was funny. Then I inquired them who made the moves. They both said, I didn't. At the same time, everyone in the room started freaking out. Finally, one of the two guys accepted that he made the moves. The mood became lightened and everyone went to sleep. But before we got to sleep, he told me that he didn't do it and said that he didn't want to freak out our friends. We promised ourselves not to do it again. Next day, after exam, I came to hostel around noon. Since I didn't like lunch, I went straight to our room. As I was undressing, that notebook my friend used to take notes grasped my attention. I took it and saw the results of yesterday night's drama. Suddenly, I thought, what if the word he meant was suicide? but not Siva died. Holy crap. Then I saw the word dirge. I took the dictionary out and checked out the meaning. There was in fact a word as dirge, 
and it meant a lament for the dead, especially one forming part of a funeral rite. Mine blown. P.S. Believe it or not, this happened. I suggest you not try this stuff, as they would disturb your mind. So read it, forget it, enjoy your life, and help others. When I was a young teen, my best friend and I spent a summer surfing the Ouija board. Mostly, we just asked silly or mundane questions, and mostly we got answers that seemed to fit. There was never a specific spirit or entity associated with our Ouija board explorations, and we never felt threatened in any way. Until the day that all changed. One day, a specific personality started to communicate with us. He was male and forceful. He would tell us to do things, harmless things, like taking a poster off the wall or something, but still, it was weird. I asked him his name and what she provided. I don't remember it anymore, so I'll just call him Gordon. I asked him where he had lived before becoming a spirit. He gave an address in a nearby small town. I never went to this town, so I had no idea if it was real or not. But I did have a map, so I could look it up. It, in fact, was real. I asked my sister to drive me there. I was still too young to drive. Just to check it out. My friend was spooked and didn't want to go. So my sister and I got to this address an ordinary-looking house in a wooded cul-de-sac. Nobody was around, so I knocked on the door. No answer. I'm not willing to give up, so I knock on the next-door neighbor's door. A guy answers. He looks like he's maybe in his 50s or 60s. Too young to be old in my eyes, but older than my parents or the parents of my school friends. I ask him if he knows if a Gordon ever lived in the house next to him. He thinks for a minute, gets a little far away look in his eye, then says yes. Someone named Gordon did used to live there. But he disappeared about 15 years ago, and nobody knew why or what had become of him. He couldn't tell me anything more, just said he didn't remember anything about Gordon other than he lived there and then he didn't. I couldn't wait to get home and tell my boyfriend. I couldn't wait to pull out the Ouija board and find out more. When we did, Gordon came through right away. He was more aggressive than ever, insisting we do this and that, draw this, gather that. In fact, creepy, even though none of it was hurtful or inappropriate, it just felt wrong. I asked why he wanted us to do these things, and he only grew more insistent, more edgy, more dangerous feeling. I said, no, we're not going to do it. Why do you want it so badly? He understood that I had drawn a line that I would not cross, so he told us that if we'd done what he had asked, then he could get us to trade places with him. Whatever the fuck that meant. And then... There was this demonic laugh spelled over and over again on the Ouija board. Damn it. Poke my eyes out with a stick so I never have to see that again. It freaked us both out and that was the last time we ever touched a Ouija board. For anyone to use the board, it would depend on the maturity level of who uses it. The Ouija board is not a toy, so it is important that one partaking in it should be able to follow the rules. I wouldn't say anyone under 12 should be using it. If anyone is ever thinking about using a Ouija board, please take the time to listen to my personal rules that I have comprised of using the board 
for over a decade. These are my rules, which I have the right to publish and try to publish them in all answers regarding the board, as they are the most important because this is not a game and could put people in harm's way. I feel it is important to post these in my answer regarding the Ouija, as it will increase the chances of safe usage. If you are thinking about using the board and have read the rules, yet don't think you can follow them, then do yourself a favor. Don't use it. This is something that you have to take seriously because you can not only put yourself in danger, but others around you that aren't even playing. The main rules you want to stick to. Number one, do not leave the planchette on the board unattended, ever. If the planchette is on the board, make sure someone is holding it at all times. Number two, always say goodbye at the end of a session. Make sure the planchette goes to goodbye as well. If you do not, it's like setting a phone down without hanging up. The person can linger on the other line if they do not want to say goodbye and try to keep communicating with you. Refuse to let the planchette keep moving around the board, except in the direction to the word goodbye. Keep repeating, demanding goodbye until they do. Number three, never invite an entity to make a noise, to show you its presence, or to invite it near you, ever. You do not know what it is and what its intentions are, so please do not ever take that risk. You also never want to give them permission to do anything if they ask, especially channeling the entity. Number four, don't let the planchette go from A to Z or from one to zero or make a figure eight, either forwards or backwards. This is an incantation for a spirit to get into the human realm. If this happens, stop the planchette and say goodbye until it moves to goodbye. And do not let it move anywhere else. Number five, don't ever play it in a cemetery. That is just asking for trouble. The dead do not want to be disturbed. If someone goes to your house at an odd hour in the morning while you're resting and continuously calls you outside the door just to chat, I'm sure you wouldn't be very happy either. Spirits are everywhere at all times, but cemeteries are a breeding ground for all kinds of things, especially entities without good intentions. Number six, always play with respect and be safe. Imagine a Ouija board as an online chat room where you post your personal telephone number and wait for someone to call you. You have no idea who is on the other line. Respect whomever you're talking to or don't play at all. You could be asking for consequences if not taken seriously. Portals can be open. Demons can be invited through. You can put yourself or who is playing with you or others in your household or even the land you are on in immediate danger. It is not a joke nor a game. This is an oracle that helps you communicate with entities beyond the veil. It needs to be treated as such. Here's some tips I advise you are. Start a conversation by asking if there is anyone who would like to speak with you, as opposed to asking if someone is there. That breaks the rules as you are asking if someone is there with you. Patience is key. Just like a slow internet connection, it may take a few minutes to get a response. Don't bombard the board with questions. Ask something and wait a few minutes. If you don't get a response after a few minutes, try asking again. You may have difficulty getting the answer you seek because of the way you're wording the question. Try changing it up a little and you may be able to get a better response the way you word things is extremely important. Yes or no questions are usually the easiest for an entity to answer. 
it's helpful to have paper and a writing utensil around to write down the session, especially if they are spelling out a word for you. Just make sure that you or another player has a hand on the planchette at all times during a session, as that is a very important rule. If you are worried about talking to a good spirit and to avoid evil ones, you may very well ask them if they come with the light or simply by asking them if they are good spirits. But be careful. Sometimes demons will lie. Most will be honest and have no shame in telling you that they are a demon. However, it will never hurt you just to be cautious. Please remember that this is all based on the level of maturity of one wanting to use the board. If you take these rules seriously and are confident in your ability to follow them, then you should be all right and will be safe when using the Oracle. How do you summon a demon? It has become a normal part of my spiritual practice. This is a basic and safe procedure in its context. I do not take any responsibility for any misuse of this information. It's as complex or simple as you wish, as positive or negative as you wish, suffering or greater knowledge you choose. Which demon did you summon? Your own are the most accessible. Which methods did you use? Were they able to banish the demon? Depends on banish, but if you mean become no more present than before, then yes. Set up. Be somewhere safe, quiet, and where you will not be disturbed for at least an hour. Be relaxed and confident that worst case you pull the emergency ripcord and you just want it some time. Ensure near darkness. Get a mirror that you do not use on a daily basis set up so that you can sit relaxed and can see your face in the mirror. Get a candle, light it, and put on the same side as your ocular dominance. Ensure that roughly half of your face is in shadow and half is lit. Breathe and relax, then start when you feel calm and comfortable. First, Set your intent. Why are you doing this? What do you want or desire? Now analyze that and try and find the emotional need underneath. Second, once you can identify and feel the underlying drive upon your eyes and look at the mirror, try and see that feeling in front of you. Use your face as a framework for a new face. Use the eye that is in the shadow as the point of observation. Third, relax your eyes. Unfocus them slightly and let your face buzz in and out. Maintain that relaxed observation of the underlying drive mixing with the image of a face, that frequency and focus. Don't try and hurt your eyes. You have time. Fourth, whatever happens, happens. Don't get scared and lose your focus. Don't get excited and try to see a particular face clearer. You are an observer. Perhaps it will take you several tries for anything to happen. Maybe it will happen right away and be too much. What happens, happens. You have the means to stop it at any time using the emergency ripcord. Fifth, when an image is stabilized or you know it is the right time, say what you need to say, ask what you need to ask. Remember, like brings like, as above, so below. The golden rule, then listen inside yourself for the reply. It is hard to hear a whisper in a thunderstorm of thought. Sixth, when you are done, breathe, write something, Stretch, clean up the space, then pull the emergency ripcord, or go about your life. The emergency ripcord. 
Have a bowl of salt. Something that tastes good, like chocolate. Something that smells good, incense or perfume will do. Something you can be visually and mentally distracted by. A Netflix video you want to watch, going over to a friend's house, etc. In the event of getting too weird, or afterwards you need to decompress, leave the room you are in. Maybe go shower, then eat the chocolate, light some sandalwood incense, put on Netflix while keeping your hands swirling around in the salt bowl, thus sealing up your sense doors. To the one person out there who will take this leap into esoteric practices, I salute you, wish you many blessings and much personal growth. I've noticed that many answers are full of fear due to lack of experience, technique, or cultural baggage. If one is free from fear, there will be no place for it to reside in you. Don't bring fear into spiritual practice. Banish, defeat, destroy. See how those terms presuppose conflict, creates illusionary resistance, subtly generates something fearful. All this is in your own mind. Any demons are your own. Many, many moons ago, I'd say I was 12 or 13 years of age at the time. So this would have been during the onset of the fall in 1992 or 1993. It was a normal human night in the small city of Morale, Louisiana. The street I lived on was very well lit with several street lamps lining the entire way. It made it easier for all of us kids to play hide and seek as it was dark enough in the unlit areas to hide. But plenty of light to see someone making a beeline for the base. We've seen it plenty of times before. My friend's sister, who was seven or eight years older than us, liked playing on the Ouija board. But this particular board she had was not the Milton Bradley board you could buy at Kmart around the way. This board she got from her aunt, who was into voodoo for the fun of it, was a board bought from an obscure store in the French market area of downtown New Orleans that was well known for its connections to the dark arts. We were always interested when she would take the board out, but we were also very skeptical that she actually spoke to the dead with it. We would all tell ourselves and each other that she was really the one moving the planchette to the letters. I had never actually touched the board or planchette before, nor had I any real interest because even though I didn't think it was real, who wants to be the one proven wrong about that kind of stuff? After all, there were plenty of horror movies involving witchcraft and dark art that gave me enough of a pause before making contact with anything involved in said things. However, that didn't keep from at least watching. Besides, if things got too creepy, I could always walk away. But there it was, in all its creepy splendor, sitting on a cardboard box that my friend brought out so that we could all gather around to see if his sister was really faking it or not. Something certainly seemed off as setting up the board with a planchette, but we were all no older than 14, so what did we really know, right? My friend's cousin swore she saw the planchette move after he set it on the board, even though nobody was touching it. Someone tapped the box and jolted it. Stop making stuff up, right? Little did we know what was going to happen that night. We all sat there looking at the board and planchette. The only one touching it so far was my friend Joey name change, obviously, and that was only to set it up on the box under one of the street lamps. 
Nobody really wanted to touch it, but we couldn't chicken out on this, so we decided that we would use a count out game to determine who would be the first two on the plane jet. I made sure that I did the count out game because I certainly didn't want to touch it. I was pretty good at making sure I always got counted out. Yep, I was that kid. Don't judge me. Finally, only two remained of the eight or so kids out there. Joey, who actually volunteered, and Jamie, who I think was suddenly feeling very faint about the idea of actually going through with this. But on they went, placing both their hands on the planchette exactly how we had seen Joey's sister do several times before. For what seemed like several minutes, but in reality was probably only 30 seconds, nothing happened. I remember chiming in that I knew it was fake and that your sister moves it herself. Then the planchette started to move in the infamous infinity loop around the board. We all kind of backed up about an inch or so with a few woes being let out. Of course, we were ribbing Joey about moving it, but he swore it wasn't him. The next obvious thing was that Jamie was moving it, but she was definitely getting frightened at the whole thing. Her whole face had turned slightly pale, and I really thought there might be something wrong with her. After about another minute, one kid says to ask the spirit some questions. So the normal round of yes or no questions comes out with the spirit answering them promptly via the planchette, stopping on the requisite answer, then starting back up in the infinity loop again. This all goes on for about five minutes with just asking simple questions until I ask what its name was. Let me note that this went on for quite a while. But in the interest of the reader, I will shorten it up by telling you all that we had learned through questioning that Lauren was 16 and had drowned in the Mississippi River, which was only 12 blocks from where we lived. The plan jet spells out a name, Lauren. Honestly, I don't remember the name, which is odd to me considering I remember so much detail about that night. But for some reason, I couldn't recall the name. But for the sake of the story, I'll say it was Lauren. At this point, we now understood the spirit to be a girl. And as the saying goes, there is one in every crowd. This kid, Ryan, asks if she is hot. We got a good chuckle, but it faded quick as the planchette stopped at no and then proceeded to spell out C-O-L-D before starting its infinity loop back up. At that moment, a very slight chill seemed to blow through where we were at under the street lamp. I remember that cold feeling like it just happened. Even as I sit here typing this, I can feel the cold chill that swept through. It was not like any coldness I had ever experienced. Not like a winter wind blowing or the cold feeling of opening a freezer. It literally, like it literally felt like the air died or something. Everyone then just hung on that moment for what seemed like forever before another girl asked the spirit if she was there with us. As the planchette stopped on the yes, Jamie released her hands from it and left it, Joey. But it didn't stop moving. It kept going back into its now mesmerizing loop, waiting for the next question, or for something else. Jamie couldn't handle it anymore and decided that she wanted to go home. Several of us lived on that street, so it was an easy walk, but three of the kids that lived on another street over and would have to ride their bikes on a long, long trek back to their house. Jamie started to walk to her house, but another girl stopped her. Come on, let's just watch it until it's finished, she said. But Jamie no longer wanted to be a part of it. However, Ryan, who was the 14-year-old, convinced her to stick around, and she did. 
Back to the board we all gathered. As Joey sat there with his planchette, spinning and spinning in a dizzying fashion. Apparently, when Jamie tried to leave, it agitated the spirit, and the planchette started spinning faster. Things were getting incredibly tense, and I felt like something bad was going to eventually happen. Ryan was still completely skeptical of it all, and decided to tempt Lorne further. Ryan thought it would be funny to ask sexual questions, which caused the planchette to start spinning a little faster. Joey told Ryan to stop being stupid because he felt like he couldn't hold the planchette if it kept going any faster. Ryan responded by saying that he knew Joey was the one moving the stupid pointer in the first place and that he didn't care about some dumbass spirit. He then yelled at the board and said, If you're really here, then show yourself. As I recall... This final moment of that night, I still remember thinking that I have never ran into my house as fast as I did that night. It was probably one of the most daft things I have ever done in my life, but the sheer madness of what occurred called for it. I didn't look back to see if anyone else stuck around, nor did I do the gentlemanly thing of making sure the girls got into their houses. I simply got the most tunneled vision I've ever had and saw only my house, my mom, my bed, my room, and that was it. After Ryan had yelled at the board, Lauren decided to show us that she was truly there with us. That same cold that had penetrated deep into our beings earlier on came back again, but that wasn't the only thing. As we sat under the street lamp, contemplating that piercing cold, every other light on the way down the street went out at the same time. We all looked at each other for about a split second before the full realization of what had just occurred fully hit us like a fist to the face. And then we all left. I remember hearing the girls screaming, but I never looked back for them. I remember some of the boys yelling, but I never looked back at them either. I looked forward to getting into the safety of my own home. The next day, I learned that nobody stayed. Everyone ran, even Ryan. Joey left the Ouija board at the street lamp, and there it sat all through the night into the next morning. The planchette was on the ground next to the box that the board sat upon. Joey said he let it go when he ran and didn't know what happened to it. Jamie and another girl who stayed at her house that night didn't even sleep, so we didn't see her until later that evening. When it came time for the street lamps to come on, they all came on as usual. We decided that if we just didn't talk about it, we would forget it ever happened and moved on. But no. I'm sure it stuck with others, just as it had with me. We all got a good tongue lashing from Joey's sister, who told us that we should never have been using it without her, that we were too young and too weak to be dealing with the spirit. Had an older, stronger spirit come to us instead of a young girl, we would have gotten hurt. I don't know about that, and I never will. Because let me end this with a joke. What has two thumbs and will never go near another Ouija board ever again? This guy right here. In October of 2007, I was invited to conduct a session for a group of people as part of their Halloween festivities in the Spalding area, Lincolnshire. Having conducted a number of sessions for them in the past, I agreed to attend and conduct a session by their request at 0300 hours, as considered to be the witching hour. I produced a Hellgate board. Please do not ask because I will not tell you. An oath for the event, again, 
something I had done before and used to get some really good responses with. The event started off normally with the lighting of the candles, sealing of the glass, and a protection ritual. There were six of us, myself included, around the board and eight spectators, including my scriber, who was responsible for recording all of the board activity for review at a later time. We had a resident presence, our Fred, come through and spent a bit of time with us, much to the enjoyment of the group, before we said goodbye to him and let him move on. Things then went really quiet for a bit before we started to get another response. From the outstart, something just did not feel right with this presence. I can't explain it. There was just this feeling deep inside of me. We had a lot of glass movement, but at the same time, it was very sporadic. It would give us no information and refuse to follow simple instructions, such as returning to the center of the board. Now, initially, there was nothing abnormal here. Jokers and clowns do this all the time before they settle down. However, the force on the glass was slowly getting more forceful the longer we tried to make actual communication with the entity. As we progressed, the entity seemed to be getting more confident with itself, and the glass movement started to become even stronger, and it was spending more time trying to head to my line of limitation, located in the front of Hellgate, with the group having to physically stop the glass on more than one occasion. All this time, though, not a single thing had been said through the board, and at this point, we still had no idea who or what we were dealing with. After a few minutes of this, the glass finally started spelling out things. But at that moment in time, it just appeared to be gibberish to us. It was my scriber that actually realized that we were getting messages through. The reason we could not understand what was being said was because everything was being given to us in reverse. Now, this is where I should have stopped the session there and then, potentially facing a negative entity, and closed the board. Instead, I let entry get the best of me and allowed the session to continue, something I have regretted for many years after the event. We continued to get responses both in reverse and now normal phrases mostly threatening those on the board. And then we started receiving responses in what we found out after the event through research. Latin. In my whole spirit board career, I have never received anything in Latin during any previous events. I had heard about it happening through my teachings, and apparently it was not a good sign. But never experienced it. The one phrase we got upon review that I will never forget was Angelus Reprobi, which we translated to Fallen Angel. During all of this time, we never received a name for the entity, and the glass got that strong in its movement at one point. The six of us on the board were struggling to keep up with it. The session came to a finale with people now starting to panic a little, with the glass making a direct line for Hellgate on the board. We quickly applied all the pressure we could to stop the glass, and I found myself shouting at the entity to return to the center of the board. The glass started moving a lot slower than it had all evening. I remember thinking that maybe it had used most of its energy during this dash on the board and fighting us to stop it and positioned itself at the center. Then the glass imploded. Now understand this, this thing did not just shatter outwards or crack or come apart. The thing went in on itself. This honestly was the second time in my life that I actually felt true fear. After being taken back for a few moments and after gathering my thoughts, 
I conducted an impromptu cleansing ritual, and we quickly and appropriately disposed of the board. Myself and three others experienced very disturbing nightmares following the event over the next few nights, and even more eerily, they all were very similar in nature, a very tall, dark figure taunting us from the shadows, faceless people being horrifically tortured, and the death of loved ones, all very graphic in nature. My marriage with my very loving wife also broke down very quickly after, as well as a run of other bad luck that seemed to follow me for a period of time after. I vowed following this event that I would never have anything to do with spirit boards again, and not touched one since, despite numerous requests over the years from people I have previously met through holding sessions for them. I still have contact with some of the people and who were still close friends that were there during that morning and witnessed the events that unfolded. We recollect the night in conversation occasionally and laugh about it now, but there still exists an uncomfortable feeling of just how lucky we were to get off as lightly as we did. There are things in this world we just cannot comprehend. Using spirit or Ouija boards can open doorways to things that are really not very nice at all. I believe we encountered a very negative entity that morning, even though I had done everything right and according to my teachings. This is why people who have used boards and had negative occurrences tell others to take heed and stay away from them. They are not paranoid nor overreacting. They have seen and experienced it all for themselves and they do not want to see others harmed, potentially go through a diabolical haunting or some other misadventure. And that, dear listeners, brings a conclusion to these true Ouija board stories. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mee, Cold Stone Wolf, Les Crispin, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Again, thank you all for your continued support. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>